I've traveled all the way to scenic Slovakia in order to team up with Daniel Apologetics and destroy five of the dumbest claims Muslims make about Islam in desperate attempts to win converts. Uh, well, that's a bit embarrassing. Fortunately, I have this magic tennis ball that allows me to cross time and space with the flip of a wrist. So the video is still on. Previously on Reason Answers, we've taken on some of the best arguments Muslims make with careful analysis and thoughtful commentary. And frankly, even the best arguments aren't very good. Just how dumb are you? It varies. So when I decided to debunk some of the dumbest, but also most popular, claims Dawagandas make, I knew I would need some help to avoid incurring brain damage. <laughs> Daniel was kind enough to put his brain on the line, so without further ado, let's jump in. <laughs> Have you ever heard a Muslim say Islam is the religion of peace? Indeed, the word Islam means peace. What could be more peaceful than a religion literally meaning peace? Of course you have, and chances are you've heard media tools parroting the same line after every Islamic terrorist attack. But what's the real story? Does Islam mean peace? And is it even relevant if it does? The answer is no, and no again. The word Islam does not mean peace. It actually means submission. Islam and the word for peace, salam, share a common root. But roots do not determine meaning. In English, tradition and treason have the same root, but different, almost opposite meanings. Same with shirt and skirt, or naive and native. And no one would confuse a locust with a lobster. Yet they too come from the same root. A locust isn't a lobster, and Islam doesn't mean peace. But even if Islam did mean peace, it would still be irrelevant. Any group can call themselves whatever they want, but it doesn't make it true. A thief doesn't become a hero because he calls himself a liberator of wealth, and Islam doesn't become peaceful because someone says it is. We need to look at what Islam teaches to actually answer the question. There are many violent commands in the Quran, Hadith, and biographies of the perfect example for all Muslims to follow. But one will suffice to prove the point. Unslay them wherever you come upon them, and expel them from where they expelled you. Persecution is more grievous than slaying. Next up, Daniel will take on Muslim claims of scientific miracles. Oh! The magic tennis ball? Peace be upon you. What? Sadius sent you here so that I could debunk the scientific miracles in the Quran? No, I will not. Alhamdulillah, I have a message to all of you Christians, Hindus, Jews, and atheists out there who critique and ridicule this claim. Stop it! It's time that you all start to embrace the revealed scientific miracles and facts in the Quran. Because these scientific revelations, revealed to Muhammad long before modern science ever knew, proves that the Quran is the divine eternal words from Allah. How can you not be swept away by all the scientific miracles from the Quran? Allah's eternal verbatim word. Like for example, that semen is formed between the backbone and ribs. Surah 86 verses 6 to 7. That there are seven earths. Surah 65 verse 12. That the sun and moon chases each other around the earth. Surah 36 verses 38 to 40. That human embryos are blood clots. Surah 22 verse 5. That stars are missiles Allah used to shoot at demons who try to sneak into heaven. Surah 37 verses 6 to 10. And Surah 66 verse 5. <laughs> and here you were thinking that it was meteorite rocks burning in our atmosphere. And not to mention that the sun sets in a muddy spring of water. 
In Surah 18 verses 83 to 86, Allah reveals that Dual Karnain, aka Alexander the Great, Osiris the Great, traveled until he reached the place where the sun set. He found it setting in a spring of murky warm water and that a people lived there. And keep in mind, this is not from Dual Karnain's perspective and what he thought he saw. Allah, the eternal creator and God of the universe, he is the narrator here. Also, in addition to Allah's eternal word, the Quran, Muhammad, who is considered the greatest human interpreter of the Quran, in Sunan Abu Dawud 4002, the Prophet, independently, with no reference to Dual Karnain, confirms when asked that the sun sets in a spring of warm water. And yes, this hadith is classified Sahih, Alhamdulillah, that the sun which is 1 million times bigger than the earth and is 10,000 Fahrenheit warm, sets in a place in a spring of warm water where it lives a people. All these facts are just so science fictionally, I mean scientifically proven, that there's just nothing more that needs to be said here. Hashtag Quran, hashtag science. Sanius, back to you. Did you know that Muhammad was the greatest man to ever live? Why, one could even say he was sinless, a perfect moral example that everyone should follow all the time. Indeed, even random nobody Michael Hart said so. Or at least so goes the Dawa claim. And as long as the hearer is totally ignorant of literally everything in Muhammad's reputed biography, it might even work. But once a single shred of light is shown on the question, the Dawagandist will quickly retreat. Run away! Run away! Should men in their 50s marry six-year-olds and bed them at nine, as Muhammad did, you ask? Uh, that was normal for the time, the Dawi lies. But not okay for today. Already the claim seems to be falling apart. Is it good to torture a man for money, you ask? Uh, of course not, he replies. But wait, didn't Muhammad do just that? No, 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 no. Those faithful Muslims who recorded such stories about him were liars and cannot be trusted. But of course, we know 100% they were totally truthful when they passed on the Quran and all the Hadith that we happen to like. What about chopping off heads and claiming Allah makes you victorious through terror? Is that something Muslims should emulate? Only if the caliphate says so. And didn't Jesus once said he comes with a sword? Um, that was clearly a metaphor explaining that following Jesus means sacrificing everything the world has to offer. Do not think I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. By the way, Muhammad himself acknowledged his sinfulness, asking forgiveness seventy or a hundred times a day, depending on which hadith you read. Let's go ahead and move on. Thank you, Sadius. Next one is, Muhammad is found in the Bible. Our Muslim friends have used this argumentation for a long time, because Islamic truth claims depends on it. There are at least four verses in the Quran where this claim has its roots. Problem is, there is no Muhammad to be found in the Bible. Not directly by name, not indirectly by some other means. No strong mentions, no weak mentions, indirectly or direct. I've seen Muslim propagandists and apologists trying to attribute all kinds of biblical prophecies to Muhammad. Like Deuteronomy 18.18, Deuteronomy 33.2, Isaiah 42, Daniel 7, Haggai 2.7, John 1, John 14, John 16. Ironically enough, these are also books that Muslims will say are corrupted. Because the slogan is, as we all know, the Bible is corrupted. Except where they can squeeze in a prophecy about Muhammad, of course. <laughs> Even if it's in the middle, of an erotic love poem between King Solomon and his wife. In the Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16, and I kid you not, 
you'll find YouTube videos of leading Muslim apologists like Shabir Ali, Ahmed Didad, and Saka Naik using this verse and more. That should tell you something. Jews, Christians, and Hebrew speakers are having a field day with all these attempts. Now, since Thaddeus and I agreed on around 2 to 3 minutes per point, let's just look a little bit closer on that popular Song of Solomon verse as an example. The word Muslim claim is about Muhammad in this passage is the Hebrew word for desirable, beautiful, lovely. And they will claim it sounds like Muhammad. In singular form, the word is pronounced Mahmed. In this passage, it's Mahmedim. It's plural given the context that follows. So, I guess we suddenly have multiple Muhammads in this erotical love poem between Solomon and his wife? Not only that, Muslims using this argument will say that the word is actually pronounced The word in Hebrew is Muhammadim. But here on planet Earth, all Hebrew linguist scholars are unanimous that the word is pronounced Mahmadim. And for goodness sakes, if Muslims can mix Hebrew and Arabic language to draw out a prophecy about Mahmadim, sorry, Muhammadim-ish, then this same Muslim standard should logically follow elsewhere. So, as the Hebrew word for mouse is Akbar, does that mean when our Muslim friends are shouting Allahu Akbar, that according to their own standard, they are actually saying Allah is a mouse? That's rude. Sadius, catch. There aren't many arguments for Islam, and the few that Muslims offer aren't very good. But the arguments Dawah Gandhis invent are downright genius compared to the one Allah offers for himself in the Quran. And if you are in doubt concerning that we have sent down on our servant, then bring a surah like it and call your witnesses apart from God if you are truthful. So much stupidity and only two minutes to explain it. <sighs> Where to start? Let's go with the author's own lack of confidence, as elsewhere he declares. Or do they say he has forged it? Say, then bring ten surahs the like of it. Just in case one surah wasn't enough, Allah covers his butt. <laughs> Guess it isn't that obvious after all. Next, there's the fact that no clear criteria are given. Uh -huh. How can we call our witnesses if we don't know what to judge on? Then there's the fact the challenge was not impressive to Muhammad's contemporaries, who claimed they could make better poetry and tell better tales. And no doubt they were right, as the Quran is unclear, confusing, disorganized, and even filled with grammatical errors. Satan apparently met the challenge too, by the way. Tricking Muhammad into thinking verses supporting polytheism were part of the Quran. Only years later did Muhammad finally realize his mistake and have the verses removed. Let's just say the devil made me do it. Most importantly, the challenge is simply nonsense from the start. The Quran is no literary masterpiece. But even if it was, that would in no way prove it was true, let alone from God. I can't write a play like Shakespeare, compose a symphony like Mozart, or paint a picture like Raphael. But that doesn't mean those men were prophets or that their works are the literal speech, music, or art of God. Leave it to Allah to create a challenge that is not only easily met, but would prove nothing even if it wasn't. Indeed, even most Muslims recognize the weakness of the claim and rarely go to it. Yet, strangely, this is the best defense Allah has to offer. How is he so dumb? If you are smarter than your god, maybe it's time to find a new god. But what do I know? Hmm. So far, we've covered five dumb arguments Muslims make about Islam. But the insanity doesn't stop there. Indeed. If there's one thing Dottie's love more than dumb arguments about Islam, it's dumb arguments about Christianity. And we're proud of that! You absolutely aren't going to want to miss Daniel and my destruction of Muslim claims about Christianity. So click here.
to ride the magic tennis ball over to his channel. Thanks for watching.